Thank you, everyone. I'd like to call up the panelists uh, for our next panel, which is Canada, Iran, and the Arab Spring. So we try to have really provocative titles, but we have speakers all day and evening that we are humbled by, and we want to thank you for being here. I'm going to introduce the moderator, and he will introduce the speakers to you. Peter Goodspeed is a newspaper reporter with 39 years of experience. He's a senior reporter for international affairs for the National Post. Peter has worked as a foreign correspondent, war reporter, editor, manager, feature writer, and political reporter. He spent three years as foreign editor at the Toronto Star and served as bureau chief and foreign correspondent in Washington, Johannesburg, and Hong Kong. Stories he has reported on include the Falklands War, the U.S. invasion of Grenada, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, wars in Africa, Central, Central America, the Middle East, and Asia, and most recently, the second Gulf War in Iraq. Peter was a member of the National Post team that won a National Newspaper Award for special projects in 2000, and he was one of the last Southam journalist fellows at the University of Toronto. We're very proud to have Peter as moderator for his own analysis for this important panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our hosts for putting on really a, what's an excellent convention, conference. Um, Not since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire during and after the First World War has the Middle East experienced such a comprehensive and convulsive change. Dictators have been toppled in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen. Syria is suffering a vicious civil war. Rebellion is smoldering in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Kuwait. And there's a sense of gathering crisis and the risk of military confrontation with Iran. The Arab world has changed, and new players have shattered the region's old order. But I think it's safe to say that the political transformations and tectonic shifts have only just begun. We've only seen the beginning of what may be a long, arduous, and ambitious process of political, social, and cultural transformation. The future is unclear, and it may still take decades to sort itself out. But I'm sure this evening, the, the two guest speakers on this panel will give us some insights into just what we might expect in this new Middle East, where a multidimensional struggle for power has already produced more than a year of tumult. We're still feeling the tremors of last year's upheavals, so it's just natural that politicians, diplomats, analysts, and academics are still struggling to make sense of what may be one of the most formative events of the 21st century. Yet, what it all means is complicated by the price of oil, by sectarian and ethnic divisions, by the Arab-Israeli conflict, by border disputes, by globalization and its traumatic economic transformations. Perhaps more importantly, the impetus for change in the Middle East is driven by the relentless demands of the region's poverty and its demographics. Fully one-third of the Arab world is between 15 and 29 years old and they face the highest proportion of unemployment of young, young people on the planet. It's safe to say that the Arab Spring was rooted in desperation, in economic need, social despair, and political rage. Right across the region, Arab peoples were fed up with their lot in life, and they sought to do something about it. They were tired of political stagnation, of crumbling public services, of police brutality, of mass unemployment, and of a pervasive sense of failure and humiliation. So they've reached out for something better, and right now, I don't think even they know what that is or if they will attain it. But you should take hope in the fact that the Arab Spring so far has been less about new leaders and old theologies than it is about a yearning for hope and pride and a belief in the possibility of change. The revolutions of the past year are not just about ousting geriatric dictators like Hosni Mubarak or Muammar Gaddafi. 
It's really about shedding an oppressive past and seeking a better future. There's a new generation coming to power in the Middle East, and the transformation we've been witnessing in the Arab world is potentially every bit as significant as the end of colonialism in the 1950s or the collapse of communism. We've been witnessing a revolution instigated by the young and driven by new technologies, one that rages against old autocrats and calls for rebuilding Muslim societies. That can be a very positive thing, but as always, opportunity also contains the seeds of potential calamity. So we must be careful and cautious. As Canadians, our influence in the Middle East is modest. Yet, we should look at the Arab Spring as a chance to assist a transition to democratic rule and possibly, through aid and knowledge and friendship, help transform the region. There is an opportunity to create a safer world, to eliminate the Middle East traditional duet in which extremists challenge autocrats in countries where opposition is outlawed, and the autocrats justify their existence on the grounds they are keeping the extremists at bay. We may have a chance to break that dangerous cycle. I'm a journalist and not a fortune teller, or even a foreign policy expert. My job is essentially to ask questions and try to get other people to answer them, to mull things over and suggest possible points of interest that should command our attention. When it comes to the new Middle East, after last year's Arab Spring, the questions definitely outnumber the answers. What is it in the Arab Spring that captured the imagination of the Arab world and the world at large? What continues to enthrall and frighten? What are the challenges and opportunities for Canada in terms of our foreign policy, our economic potential, our refugee policies, our diasporas, and our military obligations? What role will religion and religious parties play going forward in the Arab world? Do we face an uncertain future with a new brand of political Islam as the Muslim Brotherhood and its allies play more significant roles? What role will the youth, youthful activists have in keeping the revolutions on track? What role do women play in the post-revolution governments? What are the implications for minorities? How will power be shared? And are the various military, state militaries ready to have their authority placed under civilian rule? What new voices have been empowered in the Arab world? Were the uprisings a collective call for democratic participation, as is commonly understood in the West? Or were they simply bids for greater human rights and dignity? What does the answer to that question mean for the type of governments that follows? The Arab Spring has changed the region's dynamics. So what do the uprisings mean beyond the borders of the countries in which they've occurred? Is Israel threatened and isolated and worried? What impact will that have on the, one of the most cru crucial relationships in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian relationship? What, role, what, what will the role of Turkey and Iran be going forward? Did NATO's intervention in Libya make the intervention in Syria more or less likely? Has NATO's intervention made Iran's leaders feel insecure and spur them to, a, to get a nuclear deterrent as soon as possible? Iran's tried to claim that the Arab Spring is part of a general Arab awakening rooted in 19, the 1979 Islamic Revolution. But isn't it really an offshoot of Iran's failed Green Revolution following the 2009 presidential elections? Could Iran, squeezed by sanctions, riddled with corruption and poor governance, become the site of a second revolutionary spring? Or are we in the West on an inevitable collision course with Iran, one in which Iran won't back down and Israel won't back off? Are there any credible alternatives in sight? Does Syrian instability hasten war with Iran? How much does Iran fear losing its only Arab ally? Could the threat of cutting Iran's supply routes to Hezbollah and Hamas hasten an, an Iranian preemptive strike against Israel? If Israel attacks Iran to prevent it from getting nuclear weapons, would it be just mowing the grass, something it's going to have to undertake again and again? Am I even asking the right questions? Is there something lurking in the uncertainties and changes of the past few months that may take us all by surprise? I don't think there are any easy answers to these questions, but
But I do hope this evening we can look at the complex situation we face and at least mull over the possibilities and the perils. We're extremely privileged to have two excellent renowned ex experts in Dr. Bolas Gaynor and Dr. Raman Janbegalu to lead our discussions. I'm looking forward to their talks. My role is to very briefly lay out some general comments on the Arab Spring to set the background for a more detailed explanation from our experts. Right off, I think there's some fundamental observations that are important. The first is simply that the Arab Spring, especially in Tunisia and Egypt, was not led by major political parties or well-established leaders. Protesters, for the most part, were young, urban, and secular. And they took to the streets to demand the overthrow, not the reform, of existing regimes. Each rebellion shared a broad range of patterns. They attracted a similar demographic in each country. They relied heavily on modern communications, using a mix of satellite TV, cell phones, Twitter, blogs, Facebook, and the internet to communicate and organize. And they distributed photographs and videos of their uprisings and their government's repression to garner domestic and international support. But one problem shared by them is the simple fact that youths armed with cell phones and computers might be able to cause a revolution, but they aren't necessarily ready to rule. Flash mobs can't govern. That's created a situation where Islamist groups and parties, because they were better organized and were already in opposition, have been able to take advantage of unrest. They have become a critical force in the Middle East. They could have that could have significant repercussions in a place like Egypt, as Islamists dominate the committee charged with drawing up the country's new constitution. It's bound to have a dramatic influence on the evolving cultures of these countries, and it may even mean there might have to be a new round of revolutions before the young people who took to the streets across the Arab world last year get what they really want. The fear is that radical Islamist groups may try to usurp leadership of the Arab world's revolutions. And rather than bringing reform and new hope, they may introduce new forms of repression. So far, groups like Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood have been extremely pragmatic. While they emerged as the big winners in parliamentary elections, they have perhaps been less theologically driven than elements of the Republican Party during the US presidential primaries. In Egypt, at least, Islamists almost seem reluctant to seize the power being thrust upon them. That may be because they recognize that apart from some vague calls to root out corruption and ensure social justice, they've not been known to emphasize economic policy. While the Islamists are being given unprecedented levels of influence, they may be singularly unprepared to address the deeply entrenched economic problems that require the creation of millions of jobs for young people who constitute the majority of the Arab population. In the past, much of the debate in political Islam has focused on the role of religion in the state, minority and women's rights, and foreign policy. Yet the one issue that really matters for voters in the Arab countries is the economy. How the new Arab governments deal with these economic challenges, fostering economic growth, creating jobs, providing key services, that's going to determine the outcome of the Arab Spring. I think a second interesting point to be made about the Arab Spring is that the uprisings, revolutions, and demonstrations have all been focused on calls for dignity, human rights, independence, and a respect for the will of the people. There was, has been no obvious anti-Israeli or anti-American influences which have dominated the Arab street protests in the past. I wouldn't make too much of this point right now because it's still early days. And as new groups struggle for power, they may well revert to singing some of the same old tunes. But one salient fact to emerge from the Arab Spring is that countries like Canada and the United States and Israel are going to have to adjust their foreign policies to deal with what's happened. Israel is directly affected by the revolutions. Its security strategy has been based on the existence of autocratic regimes that were able to maintain relationships with Israel irrespective of popular feelings. Now, Israel feels isolated and threatened, alienated from Turkey with Iran going nuclear, Egypt and Syria in the throes of revolution, Gaza and Lebanon under the control of Hamas and Hezbollah. Things couldn't look much bleaker. 
It may be understandable that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sees the Arab Spring as a backward step, which may give rise to an undemocratic, anti-Western, anti-liberal, anti-Israeli Islamist wave. Our biggest challenge as allies of Israel and as a country with an interest in encouraging reform in the Arab world may be to reassure and protect Israel while still encouraging the new liberal democratic influences in the Arab world. That inevitably will mean having to interact with political Islam, but in a way that seeks to encourage moderation and reform and treats it as a legitimate expression of current desires in the Arab world, albeit one that has a right to be included in government only as long as it does not threaten pluralism. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I think democracy is something that grows organically, and it can't be imposed or commanded into existence. It must be nurtured and nourished and encouraged and helped along. The Arab world is just starting out on a long and difficult journey, and it's in our own interest and that of our friends to be ready to guide and assist it where we can. Quite frankly, we aren't going to have any other alternative. The sooner the Arab Spring sees true democracies bloom, the better for all involved. But we may have to be prepared to deal with some messy and very difficult situations before we get there. Now let's move to the more interesting portion of the panel. We have two wonderful speakers, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy their comments. Uh, I'd like to call on Dr. Boaz Gaynor first. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gaynor is a founder and executive director of the Institute for Counterterrorism and he's the deputy dean of the Lauder School of Government and an Interdisciplinary Center in Israel. Uh, he's a leading world expert in terrorism and has made this his life's work. He's been an advisor to the Israeli government for many years, and his book, The Counterterrorism Puzzle, A Guide for Decision Makers, is used as a textbook at universities worldwide. Dr. Gaynor will speak to us on the Arab Spring and its ramifications for counterterrorism policy. Thank you, Peter, and I would like to thank the organizers for bringing me here. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, today with you. Um, maybe I should open with two warnings. A, I'm an Israeli, therefore I'm not going to be politically correct. Uh, <laughs> um, B, I do not represent uh, any Israeli official position. I hardly represent myself. So. I'm a scholar, and I'm, and I'm a counterterrorism expert. And if any of you think about second career, I would recommend consider becoming an academic. First of all, because you have a sabbatical year. <laughs> Every few years, you get a sabbatical year, full salary. You can take the time and think and research and write. And I spent my sabbatical year three years ago um, in the United States. I was teaching at Stanford and UC Berkeley. And it was a very interesting time because this was the election year when President Obama uh, won the election. <clears throat> and uh, immediately after President Obama won the election, he, after a few weeks, he traveled to Cairo, from all places to Cairo. And he decided that he will give his uh, Cairo speech. The Cairo speech set forth the uh, new American foreign policy in reference to the Muslim world, in reference uh, to the relations between the United States and uh, the Muslim world altogether. And a uh, few hours after the, um, the speech, I was interviewed by one of the TV channels in uh, the area there. And the, uh, the TV asked me, or the crew asked me the first question is, what is the reaction in Israel to the Cairo speech? And I said, look, I now temporarily live in the Bay Area. I do not represent Israel. So I cannot, uh, I cannot tell you what Israel think about it, but I'm an Israeli. And when you ask a question in Israeli, even if he doesn't know the answer, he gives you an answer. <laughs> so I think that in Israel, we have mixed feelings towards the speech in Cairo. He asked me, can you elaborate on that? I said, of course, it's a combination of hope and concern. Concern because we th think that, uh, or I at least think that, uh, the uh, buzzwords that were used there and the slogans that were used in this Cairo speech um, were reflecting a simplistic uh, way of uh, seeing the complicated uh, problem uh, that we all face 
Today, the problem of Islamic radicalism, global jihadi terrorism, and so on and so forth. Hope, we hope that we are wrong, and actually this is the right step in the right track, and uh, this would lead to a better world, and we will be one of the first benefactors if, uh, if this would be the case. Then the second question was, and what is the reaction in the Jewish community in the Bay Area to the speech in Cairo? I said, look, I definitely don't represent the Jewish community in the Bay Area, but since you've asked me, um, <laughs> I think that the Jewish community in the Bay Area have mixed feelings towards the speech in Cairo. <laughs> a combination of hope and concern. So the journalist was totally uh, uh, confused and he said, so what's the difference between the reaction in Israel and the reaction of the Jewish community in the Bay Area? I said, look, in Israel we have much, much more concern and very little hope. Here in the Bay Area there is much more hope and very little concern. <laughs> <clears throat> I have to say that in a retrospective point of view, uh, my concern today is bigger than it used to be three years ago. And it started before the Arab Spring erupted. It started when I heard about a year and a half, two years ago, a public statement of uh, the counterterrorism coordinator, actually it's the counterterrorism advisor of the White House of President Obama, Mr. John Brennan. Um, John Brennan was presenting in one of the think tanks in, uh, in Washington the new American counterterrorism policy. In one of the first statements, he was saying something along the lines, I quote from a memory, terrorism is not our enemy. Mr. John Brennan, you are the advisor of the president for counterterrorism, not the human rights advisor of the president. Where an advisor to the counterterrorism cannot say that terrorism is not our enemy. Yes, I know, you are playing with words. I do it myself, I'm a scholar. How do you play with words? Terrorism is a tactic, a tactic cannot be an enemy, therefore terrorism is not our enemy. Fine. The second statement was even more uh, uh, troubling in my view. And the second statement was again some, something along the line the, of uh, Islamists and jihadists are not our enemy. And then I wrote an op-ed immediately after that at the Jerusalem Post, <clears throat> and I wrote there, if Islamists and jihadists are not your enemy, then who is your enemy? And actually, I argue there that this message, which is being conveyed to the Muslim world, to the Arab world, is a very dangerous and very confusing message to whom? To the pragmatic Muslims all over the world, because they know that the jihadists and the Islamists are the enemy. I asked the question in my article, what is the message that you are conveying to one of your biggest ally in the world, definitely in the Muslim and the Arab world, to President Mubarak? What should he understand from the message that Islamists and jihadists are not the enemy of the United States when he knows that his life is on risk on a daily basis from the Islamists and the jihadists? He knows that he's being attacked by those Islamists and jihadists. Why? Because he's an ally of the United States and now, the patron is saying Islamist and jihad, this is not our enemy. That's, in my view, represent the embryonic problem that was conveyed by the American administration. Now, how did it happen? Actually, again, as you see, I'm trying to explain this phenomenon of, of the Arab Spring, the, what caused the Arab Spring, what are the implications of the Arab Spring from a counterterrorism point of view. If you ask me if I can summarize anything I learned about terrorism into one sentence, I would say that the answer is yes. The answer is positive. I call it the formula of terrorism. The formula of terrorism holds two factors, motivation and operational capability. It means when a certain group of people has motivation to launch terrorist attacks, and they have also the operational capability that allows them to materialize the motivation, then a terrorist attack or a terrorist campaign would occur. That's the formula of terrorism. That's true everywhere around the world. From the formula of terrorism, we can conclude, therefore, what is the formula of counterterrorism? Very simple, the same formula. To be effective in counterterrorism, you have to deal with counter motivation encounter the operational capability of the terrorists. One of the two is not good enough. Maybe it's a temporary solution, but it's not an ultimate solution. The ultimate solution for terrorism is dealing with both factors at the same time. Easier said than done. Because once you are trying to lower down the operational capability of the terrorists, how do you do that? With operative measures, you arrest them, you fight them, you kill them, you destroy the warehouses of uh, weapons and ammunitions. 
like it or not, as effective as you are in doing all of the above, you raise the motivation to retaliate. That's the boomerang effect in counterterrorism. Now, when I have this in mind, I'm asking myself, what was the difference? What is the difference between the American counterterrorism policy, the American counterterrorism policy of President Obama, compared to the debt of President Bush? And I would argue that both of them fully understand the formula of terrorism and the formula of counterterrorism. Both of them did their best in order to counter the motivation and to counter the operational capability. But the difference was, and still is, the emphasis. The emphasis of President Bush was on countering the operational capability of the terrorists. The, the emphasis of President Obama is dealing with countering the motivation that leads to terrorism. By the way, it's only natural that this will be the difference between the two. Because when you are the president of a nation that suffered an atrocity like 9-11, immediately after that you do whatever you can in order to delude the threat to uh, your uh, citizens. I was in the United States when 9-11 occurred and I was interviewed a few hours after the attack. And the first question that was posed to me time and again by the audience, by the viewers, by the listeners that uh, listened to the program was why the hell don't we nuke them? Excuse me. Who are you going to nuke? Who is they? We didn't know even that that was Al Qaeda at that, that time, few hours after the attack. Who are you going to nuke? What would be the implication of nuking? They didn't care about that. They just wanted to be safe. And I would say that any president, as liberal as it would be under these circumstances, would immediately do whatever he can in order to delude the threat and therefore be proactive and therefore use all the possible measures and tools that he would have in order to deal with the operational capability of the terrorists. And it's only natural that President Obama shifted the emphasis from counter uh, operational capability, although he's still doing a lot in that field, but the emphasis is on countering motivation. But the question is, while trying to counter the motivation. Is this is the right message that you need to send to the Muslim world, to the Arab world? Islamists and jihadists are not our enemy. Is this counter motivation or this is a type of appeasement? And I would say that this is the wrong message. What should have been the right message, at least in my view? With your permission, another anecdote. A few years ago, I was invited to give a talk in Brussels. And when I came to the auditorium, there was another speaker speaking before me. He was a, a religious cleric, a Muslim religious cleric, an imam coming from Sudan. And he was standing there and he was preaching to the audience and he was very persuasive and he said, how dare you? How dare you refer to Islam as if it is something to do with those atrocities which are being called terrorism, violence, political violence, and so on. So do you know what Islam is all together? Islam is all about Peace and clemency. You are using the term jihadi terrorism. Do you know what jihad is all together? Jihad is all about doing those good deeds and not those, those atrocities. It was very persuasive. Then was my turn. And he was still in the room, so I approached him and I said, my friend, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sincere in saying that, that you took the trouble to fly all over the way from Sudan to Brussels to share with us those two important messages. And I said, I'm not politically correct. I'm not, a, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I sincerely mean it. It's important for us to know that those atrocities, those terrorist attacks, this is not Islam. This is a misconception of Islam. That this is not jihad. This is a misunderstanding of what is jihad altogether. But between you and me, my friend, I don't really understand why did you bother to fly all over the way from Sudan to Brussels to share with us those two important messages instead of staying in Sudan or crossing to Yemen or crossing to Somalia or flying to Afghanistan or Pakistan or Yemen or you name it and tell those people which are beheading innocent civilians under the name of Islam, raising the flag of jihad while they do that, please tell them that what they do is against Islam and against jihadi verdicts. If you have a task in life, is exactly that. Because we are now, we, the whole international community, we are facing a war. We are in the midst of a world war, my friends. Wake up. It's a different world war. It's not the, like the first and the second world war. This is a war of ideas or on ideas. This is a religious war. 
But thanks God, this is not a war between religions. This is a religious war, but it's first and foremost a war within religion. Within the religion of Islam. And the only one who can win this war are the Muslims themselves. I cannot win this war. You cannot win this war. It's only for the Muslims to win the war and to gain the control on the holy religion and not let the extremists and the fundamentalists take the control. But if we are going to sweep the dust under the rug and say, no, no, no problem, Islam is jihadist, everything is okay. We are not going to see to it that the brave Muslims, the pragmatic brave Muslims, and you need to be very brave if you are pragmatic, that they would stand against those, I wouldn't say lunatics that you understand in a moment, but very dangerous villains that are conducting those terrorist attacks. This is the background, in my view, to the Arab Spring. And we should understand the Arab Spring on that background. I don't argue, God forbid, that anyone actually is responsible and created uh, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is, a, is an authentic uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, came out as an outcome of the frustration of the Arab uh, masses uh, living in dictatorships or pseudo-dictatorships or pseudo-democracies, living in a very poor uh, socio-economical conditions and so on and so forth. And this was their immediate reaction. But I would argue that the American foreign policy and the American counterterrorism policy that I described gave the back wind to this process. So we would say, oh, so what? It's a good process. Well, I beg to, be, to differ. I think that we in the Western society, in Canada, and especially maybe even in the United States, we are translating that from a wrong point of view. We are having the Western society, and especially the United States, has a certain type of naivete in reference to that uh, uh, process, which is being called the Arab Spring. I mean, even the term Arab Spring is a wrong term. You know, in Israel, we call it the Islamic winter, not the Arab Spring. <laughs> because the Americans have, in my view, in my humble view, have two misunderstandings or two naive cultural beliefs. The first one is that democracy is a miracle solution to radicalism, to extremism, to violence, and to terrorism. That's the first mistake. The second mistake is the belief that Elections, free elections, this is democracy. My friends, I would like to argue that democracy is much, much bigger phenomenon than free election. Free election is one important apparatus of democracy, but democracy is a set of values, is a combination of civil liberties, of civil society, of human rights, of respect for the rights of minority, of women lib. This is what democracy is all about, liberalism. And yes, in democracy, it's very important to have this tool of free election. But when you have only the tool of free election without all of those values, then you might find yourself in a very dangerous situation in which fundamentalists take over the country. And that's what we are facing right now. And when fundamentalists are taking over the country in a democratic process, it's a one man, one vote, one time. Because after that, you don't have free elections. You might have elections, but this is a camouflage. And we see it in different countries today. So I would like to argue that the process, you know, it, it's still in the midst of the process. I agree. We don't know where it's leading. Actually, we do know where it's leading. Because we have at least two examples. One less problematic and the other one very problematic, Tunisia and Egypt. And it's leading to one political end in which the Islamists are taking over those countries. It could be less problematic Islamists like Muslim Brotherhood, we'll speak about that in a moment, or the Salafists. And President Obama was saying uh, less than a year ago, just before the election 
the first election in Egypt and well, everybody was worried that the Muslim Brotherhood will win the election, he said, I think that the Muslim Brotherhood is one fraction in, uh, in Egypt. They don't have majority support in Egypt. No, they don't. They won together with the Salafis 67% of the, of the uh, uh, voters. And that's the process that is going to happen. In other countries, we are in the midst of the process. Syria is on the way. Who knows what will be after uh, uh, the fall of, uh, of Assad in other countries. So what is the implications that we have already that we can understand from the outcome of the Arab Spring? I would divide them into two implications, short-term implications and long-term implications. The short-term implications, we already witnessed them. First of all, we see that states that was uh, uh, under the control of this or the other regime, more democratic, less democratic, we have a problem with this regime or the other regime, yes we do, but, the, but it was a state that had its own statehood, and they controlled their own territory. Today we see that the new governments, at least in Egypt, definitely in Yemen, Libya, are failed states. They are leading to something which is becoming a failure in the statehood of the state. Furthermore, we see territories that are becoming ungoverned territories. Libya, Yemen, Sinai Peninsula. This is a totally ungoverned territory. And you know what? When you have failed statehood and ungoverned territories, this is a recipe for global jihadi terrorism, infiltration. This is a recipe of a heaven for those terrorists. And that's exactly what we are seeing right now. We see it in the Arab, in the, uh, in, we see it in Sinai. We see it in Libya, we see it in Yemen, and other places altogether. So that's the first short term, where those global and local jihadi elements are being rooted in those countries. Furthermore, still in the short term, weapons. Many experts in the world is very worried today about what happened with the uh, weapons uh, warehouses of the Libyan, uh, the Libyan army. It evaporated. Nobody knows where the weapon is. Actually, now we start to understand where the weapon is. The weapon fell into the wrong hands. And we see the, this weapon, sophisticated weapon, pop up in different conflict areas in Africa, in Nigeria, in Niger, in the Middle East, in Sinai, in Gaza. And we'll see it all over the world because it's going from hand to hand and it will, it's being sold in the black market. And these weapons is going to fuel the terrorist activity around the world. But are, this is only the short term. What about the long term? I wouldn't argue that this is deterministic what I'm saying right now, but it's more probable. I said already that we see the trend, and the trend is the different variation of the Muslim Brotherhood taking over those, those countries using or misusing the democratic process. Those Muslim Brotherhood, you know, you have different uh, uh, interpretation and variation of them. We even heard uh, uh, some American prominent leader that says they are not even religious. Don't be worried about them. Well, they are religious. They didn't change their, their views. And they have the ultimate goal. By the way, that the Salafist has the same ultimate goal. And the jihadist and the terrorist has the same ultimate goal, which is spreading their version of Islam and creating caliphate state all over the world. The difference between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda for that matter, one of the biggest differences, is that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't call for the use of violence, doesn't call for terrorism, but the ideology or the, the ultimate goal is the same ultimate goal. Now what will happen after they will stabilize their new governments. No doubt that they will emphasize and they would be focused in harnessing some of the resources of their states into what? Into the Dawa activity, into the ideological, religious services, welfare, and all those things that are helpful in buying hearts and minds of the masses. They do it 
way before they took the control on those countries. But now they have the ability to harness those resources to do the same thing that they used to do before, but with much more power, much more resources, and much more capabilities. So you will have much more people that will be exposed to those ideological ideas. Again, without the call for terrorism and violence. Seems to be okay. But what we know, that some people, minority, learn from those ideas that there is a need to take a gun and to use violence in order to promote the same goals. They have different views from the Muslim Brotherhood, but they take the Muslim Brotherhood ideology in order to create splinters group, much more dogmatic, much more terroristic. Who's Hamas? Hamas is the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood by definition. Zawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda, the one who replaced Bin Laden, he has a lot of different, uh, different views than, than, than the Muslim Brotherhood. They have a lot of debates between them. But he used to be a Muslim Brotherhood activist. He is an, he is an Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. He got his early education in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So the Muslim Brotherhood gave birth to those extremists, intentionally or unintentionally, but that's what happened. So for the long term, I would say that we would see that this process would lead into uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the birth of splinter groups of terrorist organization, which will be even more problematic than Al-Qaeda. To sum this up, I would like to say that we are living in a very challenging time uh, this is tectonic changes, not, not less than that. And I didn't speak yet about Iran. Probably will have the time to speak about it during the q and I don't want to take too much time uh, of yours. But if you ask me one of, what is the biggest challenge of the Western society, of the whole world today, is to call a spade a spade. Is not to hide behind political correctness. Because nothing good will come out of it. We need to stand firm against those radicals and against those extremists. And we need to define and to, we need to find out and we need to support the pragmatics. And, and we need to have a very clear message to the Muslim world, to the whole world. It's your problem. It's an internal problem in Islam. We are here to help you in anything we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. Dr. Rahman uh, Janbeglu is a leading Canadian Iranian intellectual. He holds a doctorate in philosophy from the Sorbonne. He's done postgraduate work in, as a fellow at uh, the Center for Middle, East, Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard. He's been the head of the Department of Contemporary Studies at the Cultural Research Center in Tehran, and he served as a professor of democracy at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi. He's currently a professor of political science at the University of Toronto, and is a research fellow at the Center of Ethics at U of T. Dr. Jan Beglu has done extensive work in promoting dialogue between cultures, and he's written many books and articles on philosophy and politics in Persian, English, and French. In April 2006, Dr. Janbeglu was arrested by the Iranian authorities on his way to an international conference in Brussels. He spent four months in solitary confinement in Evan Prison, and according to the Iranian newspapers, was accused of being a conspirator in an American plan to topple the Islamic regime in a soft coup by engaging in cultural activities against Iran. His arrest triggered an international outcry that saw the European Union and over 400 prominent international figures, including Nobel laureates, scholars, human rights activists, and, and uh, the public, demand his release. Luckily for all of us, he's, he was finally released on bail, and he'll speak to us tonight on Iran's role in the changing Middle East. Doctor. Uh, excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here tonight, and uh, I'm very thankful for the invitation. And 
as an Iranian Canadian, I also try not to be politically correct, but uh, I try to be morally correct, maybe, uh, as a nonviolent activist. And uh, I do believe that uh, politics is not only a process of leading, but also a process of listening and learning. So I'm here uh, not only to share my ideas with you, but also to listen and learn uh, from you. Um, I do believe that it's a very challenging times, and I do believe that it's also um, times for hope and uh, pragmatism. Um, I believe that uh, 2011 actually uh, has been a, one of the most significant years in the history of the modern Middle East since uh, World War I, and, but events actually continue to move so quickly that uh, even if we wanted to write, uh, Professor Gaina and myself, if we wanted to write a book about uh, what's going on in the Middle East, I think uh, uh, tomorrow our book is not going to, uh, there are going to be some changes and everything is going to be, uh, we have to change everything. But nevertheless, I do believe that the Middle East is experiencing uh, historic changes, uh, but without uh, many uncertainties and or predictable outcomes. It would be very difficult to talk about the, the outcomes. Uh, what we know, uh, everybody knows here, is that uh, leaders have been deposed in three Arab countries, and certainly there's going to be a fourth one, uh, Bashir al-Assad, uh, in Syria, uh, inshallah. Uh, as we say in, in, uh, in, in Muslim, in Arabic, or in, in Persian. But uh, in that focus uh, on domestic upheavals uh, in the Arab world, uh, we might be uh, missing the other big story uh, of the Middle East, as we have done it in the past uh, two years, it, and that's the Iran 2009. I think it's easy to forget that Iran's 2009 uprisings, demonstrations against the rigged elections uh, of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, preceded and inspired, actually, the gatherings at Egypt's uh, Tahrir Square and uh, elsewhere. Um, however, there was uh, little international outcry over the Iranian government's uh, crackdown of the Green Movement, and there has been little outcry as the repression is continuing today and has been continuing in the past uh, three years. Well, uh, in its uh, latest report on Iran, Amnesty International actually highlights the continued house arrest of the two presidential candidates and a sharp rise of public executions. And I think that uh, it's my role to talk about that. So I do believe, unlike maybe some of you, that what the Iranian leadership is afraid of is certainly not Israel. But or the West, but the memory of 2009 and the possibility of a new Iranian spring. As surprised and disoriented uh, the Arab web it was, uh, the Iranian regime was by the Arab uh, awakening, I think that Tehran has been scrambling to respond to the shif shifting uh, sands of uh, regional uh, geopolitics uh, because the Tehran and the Iranian leadership saw the Arab uh, uprising as uh, an unsitting uh, the Western and uh, American allied Arab countries. This is how they interpreted uh, actually the Arab uprising. But uh, we have to add that Iranian authorities did not anticipate that the upheavals uh, in the Middle East and the Maghreb uh, could spread to Syria. Uh, because, as you know, the fall of Assad is catastrophic for the Iranian regime, and uh, it means that uh, Iran is going to, or Iranian leadership, will be virtually friendless uh, with the fall of Assad uh, in the region. In any case, I do believe that the religious authorities in Tehran have shown that they prize their survival above anything else. Uh, Many analysts in Iran believe that the Iranian leadership is deliberately provoking international armed action uh, to stop the rise of a new Iranian spring. And I do believe uh, that's the case. Because the Iranian regime, actually, and especially the Revolutionary Guards, hope 
that in the case of a military strike against Iran, people will gravitate again toward unifying behind the government. And that's also part of uh, their strategy. Uh, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the Iranian government's nuclear issue has to do more with Iran's domestic affairs rather than its foreign policy. And I think by saying that, I'm adding something to uh, our debates uh, tonight. Uh, why? Because its aim would be to provoke a, a Western response that would create a nationalistic sentiment amongst Iranians and provide actually the Iranian regime with a security pretext for more repressive measures against the dissidents and the democratic opposition. If uh, you know a little bit of Iranian history, they have done it already in the 1980s uh, during the war with Saddam Hussein. However, I think one big factor may uh, help sustain actually the Iranian opposition despite its current weakness and that's the Iranian economy. Uh, other than oil, uh, the economy is in a very bad shape uh, in Iran, actually. Iran has suffered an inflation of at least 50% uh, in the last two years, and the currency, the Iranian currency, has uh, depreciated for by 40%. So uh, that's, I think that would be a, a, a big uh, uh, challenge for them. Uh, meanwhile, actually what's happening in the Iranian domestic uh, policies actually is that Iran's uh, new parliament actually will be largely dominated by conservative supporters of the supreme leader and uh, I have to stress here again that uh, the supreme leader of Iran in the recent years actually he has created for himself a kind of a cult of personality uh, which uh, has found more echoes uh, among the Iranian paramilitary groups and the Revolutionary Guards, rather than even among quietist clergy and the Grand Ayatollahs, uh, either in Iraq or uh, in Iran. So uh, that's one of the aspects that I think that we need to talk about. The second aspect, which has to do once again uh, with the Iranian domestic policy, and it's, uh, it has its consequences for the future of the Middle East, is the militarization of Iranian politics. Uh, I mean by that the rise of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran and not only the ideological rise but also uh, socio-political and economic uh, uh, rise. Uh, more broad, broadly what I'm saying is that uh, the growth of the Pastoran, of the Revolutionary Guards actually and the, as a strategic economic uh, controlling uh, system but also as a politically controlling system uh, includes actually the countries, the Iran's increasingly uh, long-range missile program. And th that's, that's, I think, the, one of the most uh, dangerous things. Uh, what I'm trying to say, actually, is that uh, the Islamic Republic today is increasingly becoming a, a military oligarchy with a clerical face, not a clerical oligarchy with a military face. Actually, military oligarchy with a clerical face. And uh, I do believe that the IRGC's socio-political profile is set to grow even more if there is a possibility of confrontation between Iran or Israel or Iran and the US. And the Iranian regime seems to uh, deliberately uh, courting disaster by using a confrontational rhetoric and preparing events such as uh, the assault on the British uh, embassy uh, in Tehran a few months ago. So the fact is that Iranian regime, despite its visible divides into various factions, is united actually by the overriding priority of its survival. And I think that's the, the word that we have to say. And that's even the most uh, important. Why? Because I do believe that I might be wrong, and we will see that during the questions and answers. I do believe that normalization of relations with the United States uh, might mean for some of them, some of the actually revolutionary guards or uh, a more ultra conservative leadership in Iran, the end of the Islamic Republic, as it was uh, since 1979. So uh, 
the persistence, as you see, of some of the Iranian leaders in the face of rising uh, e e U.S. and EU sanctions actually uh, determines the credibility of their claim uh, to be the leaders of the Muslim world. They want to continue to be uh, the leaders of the uh, Muslim world. So th this is also one of the aspects that we need uh, to talk about. Uh, moreover, I d think, I do believe that the nuclear program in Iran is not the only issue. We do talk about it in Western media and in Western forums like this very, very often. There is another more crucial question which is important uh, to Iranians, to Iranian diaspora everywhere, but also to Iranian citizens inside Iran. And this is how to turn Iran into a democratic country, uh, playing a, a normal role in the international community. And I'm, of course, uh, thinking here in terms of a post-Islamist Iran. Uh, I'm not talking about today's Iran. Uh, an Iran which is dragged out somehow of its condition as a rock state, as a pariah state, uh, which is and also subjected to uh, sanctions. And unfortunately, I have to say that the Iranian question is too often addressed in terms of an alternative uh, between war and complete indifference. Either war or complete indifference. On the one hand, we have uh, a hawkish attitude which depicts Iran as a country of fanatics uh, moving toward an apocalyptic end. And on the other hand, we have uh, the doves uh, who have a very simplistic view of the Iranian regime and uh, completely indifferent uh, towards the violations of human rights in a country like Iran. So I think in both cases, we are missing the vital ingredients of the debate about the position and put, uh, potential power of the Iranian people in this complex equation. And when I say Iranian people, I mean young, educated, uh, democratic, inspired, inspired uh, Iranians. Now, there are several points here that I would like uh, to underline. First, I think that in relation to the sanctions, actually, there's no doubt that the EU and the US uh, financial sanctions uh, against Iran, against the Iranian regime, are hurting uh, more than uh, any previous uh, sanctions. Uh, but it is also true that the Iranian leaders have uh, locked sanctions in their own strategy. Why? Because the regime in Tehran has used sanctions as an excuse to phase out uh, its uh, costly subsidies uh, on uh, gasoline and other issues and uh, to uh, show uh, a face of victim or victimization actually more than uh, anything else. Uh, however, I believe that if the sanctions go on and they become harsher, they could turn into an existential danger uh, for the Iranian regime especially the sanctions imposed against Iran's central bank as we see it today uh, since two, uh, December 2011, uh, they are proving uh, practically very damaging. So the Iranian regime cannot continue, certainly with the economic status quo that it has uh, indefinitely. And if, if the economy collapses, uh, nothing will uh, be, I mean, no, nothing will stand and uh, the regime would be very in a huge difficulty to save itself. Uh, and this is I, where I do believe, and most of you and most of the analysts don't underline that, this is where I think that we will, the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guards, uh, actually, I think they might go and knock on Ayatollah Khamenei's door and uh, try a coup de force. Uh, because, as I said, they are not only political decision makers, but they are also economic uh, decision makers. So, uh, we have to see how uh, different international actors which are in this game, they are going to proceed. Well, the Obama administration, I think, has basically two options on the table. 
Either Washington pursues crippling sanctions, which will also have terrible consequences for the Iranian people, or it can pursue somewhat smarter and milder measures uh, with a stronger international coalition, including Russia and China, because Russia and China are not included for the time being. Because we should not forget, and because we are pragmatists that we should not forget, uh, that both Russia and China argue uh, today that dialogue and not coercion is the only way to resolve the Iranian nuclear issue. And if eventually there is a war in the Middle East or a, a strike against Iran, I think that both Russia and China will become, again, very popular uh, in the Muslim world or in the, some countries of the Middle East. So when we talk about the aims of the war, uh, the war on Iran, uh, three sets of objectives, I think, uh, come to mind. First, uh, very quickly, a war on Iran uh, aims simply to delay the Iranian nuclear program. Second, a war on Iran aims to effectively end the Iranian nuclear program by inflicting a damage on the military and political institutions of Iran. And thirdly, uh, a war on Iran aims to topple the regime. These are different scenarios, not the same. And the third one actually needs a broad military offensive and not just an Israeli strike or an American strike once or twice. So it's uh, quite different. Uh, last but not least, the, I believe that the real fear behind the Iranian nuclear program is not an imminent existential threat to Israel, not only, but rather also the proliferation of nuclear states in the Middle East. We have to be very frank on that and not politically correct. I mean, tomorrow, if Iran is nuclearized, Saudi Arabia wants to be nuclear, and Turkey wants to be nuclear, and go nuclear, and Qatar wants to go nuclear, and we know that they are already demanding to go uh, nuclear. But I think that despite Iran's capabilities, to carry out acts of violence uh, in the Persian Gulf area or uh, abroad uh, through groups like the Hezbollah or uh, other Shiite uh, militants, any military strike against Iranian uh, nuclear or military targets would be counterproductive and dangerous. Uh, this is my point of view. Why? Because I think uh, we have to avoid military action becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, any attack on Iran would be catastrophic, not just because for the world's economy, not because of the world's oil trade, uh, and we see that the price of gasoline is already going high, uh, and not uh, because of the fact that there's going to be a, a patriotic fervor among Iranians outside and inside Iran. But the most important, I think, uh, for us would be that any attack uh, against Iran is going to postpone, uh, definitely postpone, uh, or completely destroy the democratic movement in Iran. That's the most and it's going to bring back the moral and political legitimacy to a regime which has already lost it. That's also uh, one of the points that I wanted uh, to make here. So, I, in all and for all, I do believe that, and I think that diplomacy must take the lead uh, in preventing a major conflict with Iran. It's, it's very easy, usually, to get into conflicts, but it's very easy to get out of the conflicts after that. So. Uh, to end and conclude, uh, just a word about Canada and Canadians. Uh, from my point of view, the only durable solution to Iran's nuclear issue is the empowerment of the Iranian civil society. Uh, the key challenge here for Canada is to connect with Iranian civic actors, which has not been done until now, which has not been done until now. 
and as important as social media are, or political declarations are, uh, I think that these are very limited measures. Uh, don't forget the, the models that we had for Eastern Europe in the 1970s and 1980s. I'm well placed to say that because at the time I was a student in Paris and I fought for Poland, I fought for Czechoslovakia, and I, I knew how the networks were working at the time uh, uh, for uh, all these Eastern European ex-communist uh, countries. Uh, so I think it's very important, and uh, several uh, sectors of Iranian civil society, uh, like labor unions, uh, clerical dissidents, uh, feminist organizations, students, intellectuals, I think they uh, all uh, need actually help uh, somehow, and I think they deserve to be beneficiaries of Canadian uh, assistance. Therefore, whether motivated by practical security concerns, as uh, some of us are, or by moral idealism, I think that uh, Canada must recognize that the only thing, the only thing standing between the Islamic regime and the consequences of a war uh, on Iran is the Iranian civil society. For those who are fighting for human rights in Iran. Therefore, I do believe that to stop the violations of human rights in Iran and to contain the danger of war with Iran uh, is actually helping the Iranian diaspora here in Canada and in the US, uh, helping these Iranian civic actors, helping the Iranian civil society. And I think uh, this is one way that Canada could be in line with its ideals and principles of peacemaking and peacekeeping. And let me finish just by saying that uh, the, if the truth is that we should not prematurely or unnecessarily go to war with the Iranian regime, but we should also take a firm, firm stand to condemn human rights violations in Iran and to put pressure on the Iranian regime to comply with its international rights obligations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope we'll be getting some questions in a minute. I had a couple of things maybe just to start with. Um, I had one question for, for Dr. Jambeglu. Uh, it sort of just follows up in your end. Uh, I just wondering how successful you think the Green Revolution may be in, in, in coming back. Uh, are there things that we can do immediately that, that, that we'd be looking at in the time frame that people have been talking about in the next 12 months? Should I answer right now? Sure, if you can, yes. I'll just get some. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, the Green Revolution, as you mention it, uh, you name it, is going to come back greener, uh, even, I, I would say. Uh, for the good reason that um, I didn't mention it, but uh, for those of you who have read about Iran or uh, uh, know a little bit more about Iranian society, uh, Iran is a very young country, uh, actually uh, something like 70% under the age of 30, educated people, very disenchanted, and I would say <coughs> rebellious young people. I usually call it the James Dean syndrome, you know? Uh, but these are not rebels without cause, uh, as Elia Kazan wanted to mention. These are rebels with a cause right now. And uh, I do believe that uh, uh, both inside and outside Iran, as we can see, uh, uh, Iranian youth is quite mobilized. And, and uh, there are very interesting points. Uh, first of all, Iran is maybe the only post-Islamic country in the Middle East, with no doubt. I wouldn't even say that Turkey is a post-Islamist country. But Iran is certainly uh, Iranian society. I'm not talking about the Iranian regime. Iran is a country which has already turned the page on Islamism. And uh, I think that there is no fear uh, for uh, Israelis or anybody else in the region to see uh, Islamism coming back to Iran in the future. So I think that uh, eventually if uh, there is more uh, um, 
I would say, concentration and more attention given to Iranian civil society and the democratization process in Iran, it was certainly uh, we have, will have a, a, a new movement in Iran. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Gaynor. Uh, it says, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has also written a book on terrorism, but is he not following his own advice? Why? <clears throat> Well, I'm happy to say that in the first page of the book, he thanks me for helping me, for <laughs> helping him in writing the book. Um, well, I, f look, it, probably we have a saying in Hebrew, things that you see from here, you didn't see from there. Meaning, to be in a position of a prime minister in general, and to be in a position of a prime minister in Israel particularly, uh, you face on a daily basis very, very hard decisions. And I, I, I believe that the question refers especially to uh, the decision of Benjamin Netanyahu to release uh, 1,000 uh, Palestinian terrorists from the jails um, uh, in return of our soldier, our kidnapped soldiers, Gilad Shalit, which is and uh, which was uh, against anything that uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu uh, preached for many years and wrote in his book, and we had many discussions on, on that matter. Um, my reaction to that, I was against the uh, release of the terrorists for the, for the Israeli soldier. When he was freed, I was interviewed in the Israeli media, and they said that my mind is saying that this is a great mistake. My heart is saying that this is a, a victory for uh, uh, for human or, or human decision that needed to be taken, and I don't envy anyone that doesn't have the heart that would tell him uh, and would lead him to that direction, or the mind that would tell him that this is a mistake. Meaning, Bibi Netanyahu um, made, in in this case, maybe the biggest, uh, uh, the most difficult decision uh, he could ever uh, done. I think that nobody can criticize him for that. Although I, I'm against his decision, I am not criticizing him for that because uh, this is a, an almost impossible decision for, uh, for a human being and for a decision maker to, to make. One sort of follow-up question is, uh, one of the interesting things about the Arab Spring is that the Palestinians have really been on the sidelines all the way through it. Uh, this coming Friday, there's gonna be the Land Day demonstrations and there's been a lot of talk of international activists coming into Damascus and Lebanon to try and possibly foment some kind of a confrontation. And I was just wondering if one more element of a continuation of the Arab Spring is the threat of a third intifada. And do you see that as a possibility? I think that there is a connection, uh, definitely, between the Arab Spring, the, those um, demonstrations and uh, rallies uh, that threaten the Israeli sovereignty by uh, trying to march into Israel over the borders. Um, and it's all very well connected to what uh, we have discussed before. Um, I think that what we see here is again uh, um, misunderstanding of, uh, of democratic processes. The, uh, from, again, from a counterterrorism point of view, we see more and more terrorist organization which become hybrid terrorist organization. And what's a hybrid terrorist organization? It's an organization that is active both simultaneously uh, in the terrorist arena, conducting terrorist activity, promoting terrorist activity, supporting terrorist activity, but at the same time is claiming that it's a legitimate organization uh, because it's uh, developing a political arm, is uh, is being active in the political arena, he has a welfare uh, activity and so on and so forth, and this is a hybrid terrorist organization. I tend to believe that hybrid terrorist organizations are even more dangerous than classical terrorist organizations. Why? Because they deceive the world. If you take, for example, Hezbollah, I think that many people will be surprised in the room if I would say that there are only four states in the world that define Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. By the way, Canada is one of the four. And, uh, and this, yeah, I, I, applied, I applied Canada, applied Canada for that. Uh, I think that uh, it, it reflects the danger that you have in a hybrid terrorist organization. Hamas 
was taking uh, uh, Hezbollah model for many years, and even in that matter, and Hamas fully understand that because of the Israeli counter-operational capabilities, activities, Hamas find it very difficult to launch terrorist attacks against Israel, almost impossible from Gaza Strip, no doubt about it. One of the compensations that he has is, is using another type of terrorist activity, which is uh, shooting Katyusha rockets and Qassam rockets towards uh, Israeli uh, civilian targets. But the other thing was mentioned by Ismail Aniya, one of the leaders of, uh, of Hamas, and he said our conclusion is that we would shift our activity or the, or the main effort of our activity from the terrorist attacks as if he has any other option, from the terrorist attack into this so-called political uh, um, demonstrations against Israel. And, and Hamas and those terrorist organizations today are trying to use this new uh, type of activity uh, against Israel, um, claiming that this is a peaceful demonstration, but when somebody is uh, climbing on uh, your border, uh, don't respect your sovereignty and with uh, huge masses is trying to infiltrate to your country, this is not a peaceful uh, uh, activity and uh, probably it will not be regarded as such by Israel. Um, a couple of questions for Dr. Jambeglu. Uh, one is, uh, it says, an earlier speaker mentioned India buying Iran's oil and paying in gold bullion as a way to sidestep sanctions on Iran's central bank. If India and China and others do this, will this allow Iran to avoid the sting of sanctions designed to isolate Iran and make it incapable of selling oil and being able to sustain itself? Is there a way to make these sanctions effective to bring down the regime? And another sort of almost related question was, is just said simply that uh, the political approach has not worked with Iran for 30 years. Why do you think that we should uh, delay further uh, with a political option? Yeah, um, I don't understand what is the political option. Uh, do you mean uh, uh, by the political option uh, uh, the process of democratization in Iran? Or, uh, because for me, uh, uh, the political option today uh, would be, as I said, and it's very closely related to the sanctions, actually, uh, if the sanctions are, uh, would function in the same way as we had sanctions uh, against South African apartheid regime, for example in the 1980s, 1970s, 1980s. Uh, if we have uh, uh, somehow smarter uh, sanctions against the Iranian regime, and especially against the military institutions, uh, which will not touch uh, directly uh, the Iranian people, I think that that would certainly put uh, the Iranian government in a lot of trouble. And uh, there are only two scenarios if we don't have a strike or war uh, against Iran. One would be a military coup, is it, meaning uh, you will have a, some kind of a rise of the military in Iran. Or the second would be the people will come in, on, into the streets again uh, because of the su economic su suffering. So, uh, so that I would say that the most important again uh, in the analyzing the Iranian situation today would be how we should always have in perspective the democratization process of Iran and not just going blind uh, into a, a process of getting rid of the regime or balkanization as some people like Michael Ledin and others talk about in Washington. I'm mean, totally against that. I mean, the balkanization of Iran would be a great danger not only for Iran but for Israel uh, because uh, if we all agree that Iran is not only the Islamic regime or the Islamic theocracy, but the proxies of Iran all over the Middle East, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere, that would be of a great danger. I mean, uh, Iranians, what we know by fact is that many, many, many Iranian citizens are not favorable uh, to the Islamic regime, and they will not certainly support the Islamic regime. But you have to talk about these proxies also, who will certainly are ready, and some Shiite militants who are ready to die for the Islamic regime. I guess this question is probably directed to both of you. Is there some way that non-Muslims can help pragmatic Muslims speak out? What can we do to help show our sincere support? 
Oh, you can do a lot, my God. <laughs> I've been killing myself uh, talking about that, even with the Dalai Lama. Actually, I, I, I try to have a project with uh, Dalai Lama, His Holiness, which I try, I visit every year. And it's uh, mainly, I think that um, um, Western countries, and but I'm, I'm also thinking of uh, non-Muslim uh, populations all over the world, uh, they can uh, help pragmatist Muslims, they can help pluralist Muslims through workshops, through conferences, by financing and helping them with grants all over the world in our academia. Uh, it's a shame that uh, in many of our Canadian universities at UBC, SFU, University of Toronto, uh, York University, we don't have any chairs for uh, uh, Iranian studies, and we don't have any chairs for uh, pragmatist or, as you say, pluralist uh, Islam. We don't have chairs or any programs about democratization in these countries. We don't have them. So how do we want to uh, somehow incite these people to come together and have uh, these kind of uh, surroundings where they can talk together? I think that's the most important. We have to provide them with the space to be also to get to know each other. I would be very short in my answer. I think that uh, you need to draw a very clear line between pragmatism and dogmatism in, in the Islamic world, and to be very clear in that, and not to have a very blurred border between the two as uh, the Western society is uh, tending to do. Thank you very much. One last question? Okay. Um, there was one here. Actually, it was an interesting one. I don't know if uh, somebody asked Dr. Gaynor what the, the, the current state of relationship is between Israel and Pakistan. And I suspect this may go to some of the comments you were talking about proliferation and, and Saudi Arabia possibly getting a, a nuclear weapon as uh, yeah. rapidly as it would. Israel and, and Pakistan doesn't have any relations, uh, not officially or unofficially. Um, Pakistan is not in the immediate circle of. Um, uh, I would say, you know, the enemies or the friends of, uh, of Israel. Um, and we are much more concerned with closer friends right now. And I would say that uh, our relationship with Turkey is much more important right now than the, the relationship with Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.